Thanks. So yeah, we're recording. Yeah. So everyone, we're recording this um, main room, and uh, we'll also record uh, one of the. But we'll, you know, we'll let you know when that happens. One of the breakout rooms, uh, just so that people that aren't here today can get some of the benefits uh, when they watch it later. Uh, so, hello everyone, wherever you are, if it's morning or evening. Um, we're here on this series on Extinction Rebellion's principles that are such a core part of why many of us joined the rebellion. Um, and so today we're doing an empathy cafe on uh, principle number eight, we avoid blaming and shaming. And so what we'll do is um, first, uh, you know, it, it's many of us here today, so we'll invite the people introduce themselves. There's a round of introductions in the breakout rooms rather than here in the main room. Uh, so we'll do that. And so first I'll invite uh, Paul, who he was here today, to speak a bit about the principle to get us started, maybe a bit of inspiration. And then uh, we'll have uh, the method explained, simply the empathy circle method, just in case you're new to it. And then we'll go into the breakout rooms. There'll be a facilitator there. Uh, you'll be in smaller groups of uh, four to six people. And then you'll have about an hour and a half uh, to share your own thoughts on the principle there with others. And then we'll come back here to the main room so we can share with each other in the big uh, circle whatever you're uh, learning from this before uh, we go. So. Um, it's really exciting. It's almost 30 of us here. Uh, and yeah, so it's we avoid blaming and shaming, and it's got a subtitle as well. We live in a toxic system, but no one individual is to blame. So uh, yeah, Paul, if you're happy to walk us through. Thanks, Marta. And uh, yeah, hi everybody. I'm Paul. I'm from the Future Democracy Hub in XR. And um, yeah, Empathy Circles is a part of that. And um, the main project we're doing at the moment is all about trusting the people and uh, getting grassroots democracy going. And you can find out about that um, on Reset TV. Uh, I feel very honored to be asked to come here. I don't feel particularly qualified any more than any of you are, uh, but it's lovely to see so many faces. And if I can um, plant some seeds about things you could possibly talk about um, and go into with this principle, uh, then I'll be pleased to do that. Um, I, I I do have the principles on my board in front of me every day, and I and I, the, I think principle eight is the one that I've thought about more than any other. Um, so as Marta says, it's um, we avoid blaming and shaming, and we live in a toxic system, but no one individual is to blame. So I'm going to start off with just a little bit about how that and what that means to for, to me in terms of the XR context. And it is this system change versus individual behavior change. And I've always been of the, the understanding that system changes is the, the main catalyst, the way in. I know that's not everybody's view, and I'm happy to have people think differently. Um, but my own personal experience is that what we're trying to do is to focus on getting the social and political will to facilitate that systemic change. Um, so rather than in the case of the 5p charge in the UK on the plastic bags, I know there's been other issues with that, but that did create a 90% drop in the use of those things. Whereas people like me and you may have been, you know, taking our own bags to the supermarket for, for decades. Um, but when that charge came in, that systemic uh, change caused a greater rippling effect. So in terms of blaming and shaming, um, this is, related to XR because it's it's quite easy for us to make people wrong. I think that's where we 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 end up blaming it and that causes the shame. Um, because obviously we want things to happen and change in society, but and we may be setting a good example by taking the lead in those things. Um, but it is very easy and I'm sure we've all done it um, where we, we look and think, well, that behavior is not quite right. Can you not do something different? And then it's received in a less than positive way. So it has quite a big impact. Um, and making, other people, making somebody else wrong is, is a form of shaming. And even logically, it's, 
it doesn't really work either because you get you quite often get this backfire effect uh, which i'm sure you're probably all familiar with as well where people feel challenged and where their beliefs have been has been challenged and what that does rather than opening them up it it shuts them down that they 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 protect their beliefs because they feel they've been shamed and it turns them into another another we're othering them and it's a complete lack of empathy and what we're about in this session obviously is is the very opposite of that which um uh, we, we know works very well so practical examples of do we do we think ceos of oil companies are are wrong uh, do we think meat eaters are wrong um we may have views on all of these things um and it's this conversation around are we looking to change an each, each individual or are we looking to change the system um and so what, what comes up for me around some of these things is are we able to forgive people but firstly are we able to forgive ourselves um i've got an example of i was handing out i had some leftover chocolates from a, a swarming we did and i took them to the october rebellion to hand out when i was handing out leaflets and a th few comments came back about i'm not having those they've got dairy in them and i understood that and i didn't take it too personally because i could understand where they were coming from um but that was an example as if if that was me talking to somebody outside of the movement they may have may have felt made very wrong with that and so it's very easy to do um, and there's a whole area of, of, of hypocrisy. I know there's a lot of conversation that we could go into around examples like that. Another one is if we're trying to build a movement, what comes first, the ability to reach out and connect with people or to stick to some kind of principle that we might have, we might have, hopefully we can do both. But just another example was, uh, somebody not wanting to take part in the VE day in celebrations in their road which we had just recently in the uk i know not everybody's from the uk but that was a, a celebration we had a, a public holiday um because they didn't want the plastic flags on their on their house um and it turned out that they the, the neighbors got all very upset, upset with this one person so it was a, a consequence to pay um for for that particular scenario um another thing that comes out in in xr is is public calling out which we don't ever do but it is okay as members and, and to be supportive to call out individually one-to-one -one in a supportive way so that we are holding each other to account so i think that, that distinction was was worth mentioning as well i'm going to move on now to uh, talk a little bit about what the impact of shame is and we've all felt it uh, so i don't need to really explain it but it is very profound and anybody you probably all know um the um the the, the the speaker and and um social researcher brene brown and she talks a lot about shame and the difference between shame and guilt and she explains that as guilt is i made a mistake shame is i am a mistake so it's on a much more profound level and that's the kind of impact that shaming has it's not something that passes quickly um, so it can hurt people quite quite deeply um, and she also goes on to explain that shame is very correlated with with addiction depression violence bullying aggression all of those things and so if somebody's feeling shame there's some quite profound impacts and responses that would often come back and her antidote is to be to be vulnerable um, and and that in itself evokes empathy. So that's one of the inquiries that we can maybe go into is, is what facilitates empathy? How do we, how do we, how do we initiate and, and create, create that space, it, not just in these circles, but in, in all of our interactions in life. And I listened to Prince William just on the radio this morning and with Health Awareness Week, and he's saying it's, it's okay to not be okay and i think that's one of the big things about this conversation for me is that if i'm shaming somebody else it's probably because it's directly related to something i feel ashamed of in myself and i'm not going to be able to uh, mess 
effectively change that in my behavior with another person unless I look at it, look at it first in myself. Just a couple more things. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with integral theory. I'm not going to go into it, but if you are, um, you may have heard things like teal organization that XR is and trying to be, and it's to operate at those kind of higher levels of consciousness. And one rel relevant inquiry that, uh, uh, that uh, I've been helped with in that is, in certainly in working in democracy, uh, is is it possible to truly join people in their worlds? Um, and especially if they have different levels of awareness and different levels of consciousness, if you, if you like to refer to it as that. And in the integral theory, they refer to the higher levels of consciousness. You start to have the capacity, the greater capacity to relate to people in their different perspectives, to be able to take multiple perspectives. Empathy is fundamental in that. And also, if you want to um, run a democratic process, you have to have the, the ability to, to have people feel heard, whatever their perspective. But the other thing that I've been experimenting with myself, and I don't think I've ever got there, you know, but um, you know, it's an ongoing inquiry. I think these things always are. We never actually become right and done. Um, is the ability to be okay with people not getting your position. They just don't understand where you're coming from. Um, but that's not something to expect other people to get. And, and yet we can still strive to, to understand where other people are coming from, even if it's not reciprocated. So the, the Trump supporters and the anti-Trump supporters may never see eye to eye, but you can see eye to eye with the Trump supporters and you can see eye to eye with the non-Trump supporters and pick any polarized debate um, that you, you, is, is meaningful to you. The same, the same applies. And, and as people who might be going out and facilitating, this is one of the, the big quests that uh, we have as facilitators. Can we have people feel heard and not shamed in any way? And the final thing I wanted to share is, a, is a, something that helped me. We did a, a session on, on one of these for, uh, off the back of a TED talk by a lady called Megan Phelps Roper who used to be belong to the Westboro Baptist Church in uh, the States. And they are famously, well, one program was the most hated family in America because they were very anti lots of different things. They wanted, you know, gay people hung and that sort of thing. Um, and she told the story of how she came away from that because of people reaching out to her, not the other way around. And it's a fascinating TED talk if you get if you want to get to to watch it, um, of what it took for those people to reach out to her. They had very different views, but they 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 met her and respected her and heard her and hung out with her. They built trust, and then there was a gradual um, you know inquiry into the positions that she was taking, which caused her to ultimately move. So that's another. A valuable inquiry that we can maybe look into how do we reach out to other people and and make them heard and retain that uh, respect without blaming and shaming that's me thank you so very much paul uh for that lovely share i think i'm sure that gave uh, everyone some food for thought um so I'll ask uh, if that's okay, Carolina, to explain the method, maybe, before we go, yeah. Uh, before that, can I just check, uh, Sophia, are you up for facilitating a circle? I'm just trying to get the rooms created. Uh, no, I don't think I can hold that space. Okay, that's fine, just checking. Like, the wasp is still in my... Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, was James here? I thought I saw James. So there, are you up to doing a circle facilitating? Sure. Okay, cool, great. Okay, brilliant. So, yeah, Carol, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so, I will uh, explain a little bit the method. So empathy circle is quite different from typical chat or discussion. 
and it's struck it is a structured dialogue with rules but they are very simple and easy to learn so the best number of participants uh, is four up to five people and there are three roles a speaker active listener and silent listener N silent listeners and the first person become a speaker and they select who they will speak to and for a lot of time it's usually four five minutes the speaker talks about whatever comes up for them and the active listener reflects back what they are hearing until the speaker feels heard and understood um and after that active listener become a speaker and selects a new person who will listen and reflect and that's how the whole empathy circle uh, is unfolding so when you are a speaker you can select uh, who will listen to you and it's good to include everyone to give everyone chance to reflect and then to speak but it's always your free choice whom you're choosing uh, for your active listener when you're speaking may pause as often as you can uh, to give listener chance to reflect back what they just heard uh just split what you want to say into smaller chunks so uh, a listener can easily re easier reflect back what they heard check if they understood you to your satisfaction if not say it again maybe in different words maybe add new details until you feel heard and understood to your satisfaction when the time is up and you feel hurt uh, you can say uh, we have such small habit we say small ritual we say i i'm fully hurt i feel hurt uh, and that's the information uh, that uh, you are done and now the uh, uh, the active to, uh, listener become a speaker uh, when we are active listener in our own words we're trying to reflect back the essence of what we heard from the speaker and this is the most important element of this process refrain from asking questions or judging or detaching or diagnosing or even giving advice or even sympathizing uh this is the speaker's time to be heard you will get your own time to express yourself when it will be your turn in a few minutes so now just fog leave your own view on uh, on uh, um, on the side and focus on uh, what uh, speaker says and on their view uh, you can also ask speaker for pausing as often as you need if there is a huge um, amount of information it might be difficult for you to reflect back so you can ask for pausing when we are silent listeners we simply hold the uh, the circle process we monitor sticking to the to its steps and we can observe uh, how our focus how our attention is changing from the situation when we are active listener and to the situation when we are just silent listener um, soon will be our turn and we become we will be active listener and then the speaker so more or less that's it if or maybe you want to add anything Marta? No, I think that's it. 
and uh, in your circle, you'll have the, your facilitator there with you. They'll first do you know, the rounds of introductions, and so uh, you'll, you'll have that support and that guidance there. And it'll be modeled to you as well if it's totally new. Uh, so yeah, I think we're good to go, um, Edwin. And okay. it, yeah, and then we'll come back into uh, the big room in the end. And then uh, room one is uh, Martha facilitating, room two, Bill, room three is Anne, room four is Carolina, room five is Katie, and room six is uh, James. So I think we're ready to go. Is that it? And I also put the links in there for a PDF version of the how-to, as well as uh, on arrive the document, you can add your name and contact info. And some of the groups are gonna be six people, so two of them will be. So here we go, opening all rooms. So, See you after. And we end at the top of the hour. Yep. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We have a very esteemed group here. Hi, Paul. <laughs> yeah, great. thank you. Doing a bit. Wow. What, what? It's not a random mix, Edwin. It's not a random mix. <laughs> so, so I'll do, um, so it's five of us. So I'll do the five minute uh, timing. Uh, but uh, before we start, I think it's best if we do some introductions uh, to each other. So maybe, I know we've got a big topic ahead, but maybe before, just so we arrive, um, maybe your name, where you are physically, if you want to say your XR role, that's welcome, but you don't have to. And um, maybe a word that you're with today, something from today. Um, and I can start, so I'm Marta, I'm in Cork in the south of Ireland. Uh, I'm part of the Empathy Circle groups. Um, and today's been very windy, so I think my brain's a bit windy too. <laughs> um, yeah, whoever wants to go next. Just... I'll go. Edwin Rudd, San Francisco from the San Francisco Bay Area, part of the XR Empathy Circle work group and uh, feeling excited about this topic. Glad to be here with Paul too. Haven't seen him for a while. So. Okay, I'll go next. Thanks, uh, thanks, Edwin. It's great, great to be here. Yeah, to um, connect with you guys. Uh, Andy, you're the only person I've not seen before, so hi to you especially. Um, um, I'm Paul. Um, I, I live in St Albans in in the UK, just north of London. I'm part of XR Future Democracy, uh, which um, is linked to Empathy Circles. And today, I'm um, yeah. I've it's always also very windy over here. I've been down my allotment, and it's been blowing around. Um, and um, we're trying to you know all over the country. We're trying to get communities together. And in my road right now. There is somebody cooking pizzas in their front front garden for the whole road, in and for donations to the local food bank. I've just eaten mine before this session, um, and it's wonderful. Deep hanging out in the in the road, all come from the COVID crisis. So wonderful what's going on around the world with this, but um, it's happening outside right now. I can see people wandering up and down with pizzas. <laughs> That's me. Hey, I'll go next. Um, I'm Andy. I live in South Somerset and I'm part of South Somerset XR. And um, yeah, I think this is a, a turning point in world history that we're living through. And I'm feeling um, really positive and open generally these days. And um, yesterday I went in the sea and I was the only one on, on the whole beach and it was a really powerful experience. And today I'm feeling quite delicate and very positive. Thank you. Mm. Hi, thank you. I'm April. I'm currently locked down in Scotland. Um, I'm really aware of the noise that the wind makes in a city 
I kind of forgot or I, you know, I've been a long, long time, decades rooted in listening to the noise of the trees, but it's really stormy. And the way the wind whips round corners and through eaves and just, it's, it's really noisy and it reminds me how powerful it is and that the same wind has traveled over all different lands, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, April. Um, mm, nice. So, yeah, I think um, we can just go into the practice. Now we've, we've all landed here. Um, so what I'll invite is that whoever wants to start can just start and I'll time. Maybe the first person, if they speak to me, then I can just reflect it back and model it that way. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind starting. <clears throat> oh, God, goodness. Each time I come to a new principle, I go, oh, this is a really difficult one, but this one just really is, is for me, excruciating. The effects of shame, uh, as I've um, really explored what it does to me personally and watched what it does uh, within the movement. Oh, oh. Wow, what a tool uh, for keeping people small and silent and hurt and triggering their trauma. Mm -mm. Okay, so you're saying that for you, whenever you come to these cafes and you think, oh, this principle is really uh, meaningful to you and, and difficult and there's things about it and then today again. Um, and about this one, you know, feeling that it it's very strong um, and it's also strong in your personal world, in your personal life. And so it's about um, seeing how it can be uh, harmful and how it can be uh, triggering, uh, shaming, and how it um, can have impacts on people that are not intended. Yes, thank you, the impact. And um, I have worked with Brené Brown's model uh, and her model is for shame resilience in recognition that we are not going to uh, get rid of shame. Hey, we've inherited thousands of years of it. However, how we meet it, how we name it, um, can be a doorway to empathy rooted in vulnerability so you um, you've worked with Brené Brown's uh, teachings and um, it's about uh, shame resilience and that we're not going to get rid of shame all of a sudden there's this inheritance of it um, that we can't really escape but it's what do we do with it uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, before we even can do anything with it, we've got to recognize it. And the shame has been buried in so many layers of uh, kind of other reasons for it or othering, <laughs> you know, um, that a lot of the time we're triggered by shame, but we don't recognize it as shame. It immediately has intellectually our brain tells us all kinds of reasons why we feel the way we feel angry upset it, it exploded um, small silent uh, reach for our comforts our shields you know our addictions there's many many reasons for doing this and I've been stripping back mine and I'm clear there's a lot of shame uh, at the root of these triggers. It's like that more invisible thinking suddenly becoming visible. Yeah, so you had said about uh, also the importance of naming shame when it emerges. And you had said that. And uh, it's going to emerge and you've, you've worked with it yourself. And when it just doesn't always show up the same way. 
it, it can show up in lots of different ways in in feeling small and it being angry and, and being triggered but it's important to identify those as manifestations of shame so. yes thank you yeah that uh being able to name that my behavior came from shame makes a tremendous shift to how i can uh meet it differently than i did when i was younger and i wasn't aware of my agency and how i behave yeah so it's about taking responsibility for your part in the feeling of it and um to actually seeing it being able to recognize it and naming it and therefore changing the patterns uh, that are instinctual to us of, of our younger lives, maybe. Yeah, I mean, instinctual kind of says it's in our nature and, uh, you know, it's, it is inherited, definitely. And it is also layered in through education, parenting. Come, you know, it's all locked in in layers. Was that the time? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So it's it's you were saying that it's inherited in in also um, it's part of our education and and our life experiences that it gets baked in uh, yeah. into us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate your listening. Thank you, Martin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll go to Andy. That's okay. Really listen to me, Andy. You're muted. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best to listen properly. Thank you. I'll stop off. Um, I was so excited by all this talk about Brené Brown. I've got, I've got a pile of her books, uh, <laughs> pile of Brené Brown's books, and I've been telling uh, people in XR about them. And I, I was very excited to hear Paul and, and then April talk about Brené Brown. I'll stop there. So um, you're, you're really turned on by Brenny Brown and uh, you've got all these books. So when you found out that we were going to be doing this, it felt, made you feel really good. Yeah, there's, there's a, cause there's a lot of, you know, she's a researcher. I'm a, in, I'm a researcher though in a different field, but she's a researcher. And so there's the subtleties that she goes into. What is the definition of shame and blame and what's the definitions? And definitions sometimes can be important. So, um, Brandy Brown goes deep to the subtle levels of understanding shame and blame. And the other thing is she's quite precise because she defines things quite clearly. Yeah. And I think it's um, taking the time to really understand the principles is, is important um, to sit with them, you know, and not, because I think a lot of people, and maybe myself at times, you read this principle and you create a story about what it means that is a reaction rather than a knowing. So um, there's, different levels of understanding something like this principle and initially maybe it can be a bit superficial because we just sort of create a story and just stuck with that but then if we sit with it and like kind of meditate on it really absorb what the meaning is we've, we've discovered many much more within it yeah and I've had various trying to explain this principle um, to act, you know, long-term activists um, that for whom this is not obvious at first, and there's this difference between accountability and blaming. You know, accountability is really important. You need to be able to explain accountability, but blaming is different, and so it's that difference that I try to explain. So people that have been activists for a long time often confuse accountability and blaming. They've kind of 
put them into one box. And so it might take a little bit of time to help them understand the difference. And that's something I've been trying to do. And now as I hear you say that, it sounds quite patronizing, <laughs> but, which is not uh, the way I intend, um, which leads me to wanting to name that it's also, I find, a lot easier to avoid blaming and shaming when you come from a place of privilege. So I think yeah. part for me of it being relatively easy for me to avoid blaming and shaming, I think, is because I come from a place of privilege. So um, suddenly I thought maybe I was being a bit patronizing in what I said about the long term activists. And then, of course, looking more into myself, I have to recognize that because I come from a point, a position of privilege, maybe I find it easier than people less privileged than myself to avoid blaming and shaming because it's actually quite hard if you maybe if you're not in a from a privileged uh, situation yeah because it takes some you know paul was talking about actually going into the world of the other and being vulnerable and doing all these very generous things and it's easier to be generous if you're comfortable and you're warm and you're fed and you're happy you know vulnerability is i'm not saying it's impossible but it's easier when your basic needs and safety um, yeah are taken care yeah. of so um this thing about privilege um if you're if yeah if your basic needs uh, are, are met then you can have more sort of generosity because you feel more safe and secure in yourself. And uh, I appreciated the way Paul talked about that. Yeah, thank you, Andy. I feel very hurt. Uh, my time's up as well. So it's your turn. You just pick a, uh, pick a, a listener and get back. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, maybe Paul would listen to me. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is uh, the first empathy circle that I've attended. Um, but I mean, I've been, yeah. And um, in terms of blaming and shaming, it's one of the things that I most respect in exile is this principle. Uh, out of all the things in exile, and I like many things, this is the almost the, the most important and um, you know I come more or less from a position like um, King Lear says uh, none does offend none I say none and I feel that uh, that's something I aspire to is um, to not actually blame any individual or possibly even any group, because the way that they think and speak can be understood. Mm. Thanks, Andy. So you said this is your first empathy circle, um, and the principle eight is one that you've you've you, you most the fact that Exile has it. That's you mo you most respect that aspect of of, of all the principles. Um, and you, what I also heard was that you you work with this, and it's something that you've had an aspiration to 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 pursue the not uh, making people wrong. And you quoted the King Lear quote. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I had kind of problems with my mum, and maybe. I felt very blamed in ways that I never understood. So it's been a theme of my life, perhaps. Um, and it's probably led me down various paths. But when I was young, definitely, um, I was into blaming uh, and I was a um, left-wing activist. And I thought the capitalists were completely to blame, which maybe they are. 
So you mentioned your mum. You said you got like quite a long journey with blame, it seems. Um, probably learnt a lot uh, as you were growing up. Uh, you mentioned your mum probably feeling blamed from her. And that's led you down certain certain paths. Um yeah, into into blaming, and um, you mentioned some of the kind of you know the fact that you're kind of a socialist, and some of these capitalist people you're referring to, you feel you may have blamed them. So I had um, a massive turning point with my mum at her funeral when I realised how grateful I was to her for everything she'd given me. She gave me a flint in my heart. That's how it felt, and so. I completely forgave her um, and let go of any feeling of blame towards her. And the reason why she was like she was towards me is completely understandable in terms of her background. And in terms of capitalists, individual capitalists are just doing what we all do, which is trying to survive and make a living and do what they feel they have to do. And it's actually the system that's to blame, not the individuals. So I've come to that conclusion and I feel really good about that perspective. So you're saying that um, you um, had a real breakthrough with your mom at a funeral and then you totally forgave her and were able to really understand why she would come from that place. Um, and you also followed on with that thinking regarding other people you'd blamed and shamed like the, the capitalists and that they are just playing the game as best as they can and they're victims of that system as well and i just yeah we really heard a sense of gratitude for the things that that cause you to to realize that thank you paul and um regarding the future which is um I'm, I'm really happy that you're involved with future democracy because that's really where my heart is now. Um, I really would like to see a society where we accept and include everybody uh, to the best that we are capable of generally. And of course, there'll always be ups and downs, but um, we, I would like us to generate a culture in which we do not blame and shame. And I think that's a sign that it's time. Is that right? So. Yeah, you're saying your your heart is. Uh, you mentioning that I was involved with future democracy, and your heart is in is in that. Um, and your your dream and vision of a of a society where no one is is blamed, no one is left out, and everybody's included. Thank you, Paul. You, I feel you heard me. Yeah. Uh, right. And I'll just hand over now. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I feel very moved. Edwin? Yep, listening. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really great to be here. Um, I think I want to really explore what I feel ashamed of because um, it's been quite present this week actually I've been confronted by quite a few different things and one of them in particular is I think I feel ashamed regarding my own productivity and if it's if it's not good and I'm not I'm not working hard or whatever it might be I think I feel shame so you're wanting to personally explore what the shame is uh, for you and uh, it's about if you're not working hard, if you're not being productive, you feel a sense of uh, shame uh, around that and you start off by saying you're glad to be here too. So. so um I don't really know other than just talking how to explore that really I, th uh, I'm, I think I'm very present to the the patterns that emerge and I think April was referring to um, I was 
thinking about my own patterns when you when april was talking um and if i'm responding out of shame and one thing i respond to when i'm triggered by the shame of maybe laziness as i perceive it is to become more lazy so just noticing that when you become feel like you're becoming lazy the way you're responding is to become even more lazy so that's sort of the the response to it yeah and and i think it's something it reminds me of something i say in in workshops yeah, that i've run over the many years i've been doing it is that when you're faced with a need so like i can i really feel connected in this conversation here it's not like i would have to motivate myself to go and help off the back of a a need that's been expressed so it's it's almost as if like a a shame reaction that i have is is regarding laziness or whatever whatever word it is i think you know what i mean is is how to break that it just i'm just thinking it through now is is possibly to to just reconnect with other people and any needs and it takes it out of me and i'm back into serving the world again okay so the it's like there's this this feeling of sort of disconnection from the from the need and then the and then you like don't want to do anything it's like oh you, you become even more lazy because you feel disconnected and so it's really about becoming reconnecting and maybe a way to reconnect is to connect with other people so to kind of get past that feeling of disconnection that mm. it's almost like a disconnection spiral laziness disconnection spiral sort of happens thanks Edward. and it, it goes back to something andy said as well about the the world we want to be in where there's going to be people who are not without and that was that gets me out of bed in the morning if, if there's people that can you know there's people who are hungry or or in need and 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 i don't know any scenario where people have been put in you know a position where they can see somebody with another need and they've got the ability to help that need not wanting to help i think that we all have that as humans and the other thing that i was remembering about what april was saying was the reaching for addictions and just just hearing that is helpful because so i'm thinking what are my addictions that that then become very you know it's a vicious circle there seems to be two parts one is sort of a awareness that if you can be connected to the need then you have like a motivation to sort of act the motivation to get up in the morning as well as kind of looking at the nature of addiction and i'm not quite sure how the two yeah that not quite clear something about the nature of addiction and what yeah something's there yeah i think it goes back to i i if, if I go over the buzzer, I can't always hear it, by the way. Is, is it gone? Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you. Okay, you feel heard to this. Okay, um, speak to uh, April. That would be a pleasure, thank okay. you. Okay, um, yeah, this is a really great topic, shame. Wow, I wasn't really <laughs> expecting that. Yeah, this. Yeah, I'm really kind of getting excited about this uh, topic, and uh, also that sort of Paul brought in Brene Brown, you know, and there's a, this whole shame work. Uh, it's kind of opened up a lot of doors. Mm, so you're quite excited and unexpectedly so by the topic, and uh, you also appreciate the Brene Brown work being brought in, and you see how that's opened up uh, people's engagement with it. Yeah, and uh, one reason that I had invited Paul to give this presentation is because he's put together a thinking, I think it's a thinking box presentation on this topic. And I actually I hope, wish, wish he would have uh, kind of mentioned it in his presentation that there'd be a way to direct people to, you know, some workshop on this. Maybe we can do it afterwards, but that there's uh, sort of another step, you know, for, for looking at this topic.
Ah, so you're highlighting your knowledge that uh, um, Paul has developed some some more work for people to engage with this uh, and is it the principle yeah for this principle uh, and okay. he has a process that he does called the thinking box that uh, is a sort of i think it's that it's part of that process so uh and it's it's a more yeah so it's a whole sort of lesson workshop uh that he so he's kind of been looking into this okay yeah thank you the that so uh and you said that you had wished that he'd mentioned that, that maybe we could mention that to uh, let people know that there's another way called the thinking box for people to explore this topic further. Yeah. And I just want to give a little heads up. I'm not 100% present here because I'm also doing the tech management. So I'm, I keep one eye <laughs> on all the, uh, you know, all the different rooms, the people who are, you know, maybe dropping out or dropping in. So, I just want to give a heads up that 100% of my attention is not here. Part of it is, is, uh, so I feel a little, yeah, I just yeah, want to share I, that. Thank you. You just shared that you are also dealing, you're holding a lot of things at the moment with the tech and looking out for other people who might need help. Uh, so your full attention isn't quite with us. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot of topics, but one thing that really struck me is that uh, when Andy did the reflection with of uh, Martha, he used a first person reflection. I think it's first person. I don't know the grammar that well, where you take on the role. I mean, you take like, like when I reflected, Paul, I reflected, this is my understanding of what you have said. And that's sort of one sort of form of reflection. And then another is like just reflecting as if I am that person with I guess that's first person reflection it was just very interesting yeah mm. uh, you noticed uh, a difference in the reflection when Andy was reflecting Marta and he used uh, yes the eye when he was uh, sharing his understanding um, and and you noticed the difference when yeah. you normally say you yeah, exactly. Or I, I think that you, this is what I hear you say versus just reflecting as is I am feeling this sort of a reflection. So I think it that I've seen, uh, you know, videos of Carl Rogers, who sort of developed this whole practice, kind of use that too. So kind of go between the different perspectives of the first person. And I'm not quite sure what the tense, you know, the persons are. But there's a lot of different ways of doing these reflections. And, you know, how do we, I think that can really help to sort of deepen the experience too. So I was just making a note of that and I was really quite pleased to just see how Andy was, was doing that and the effect of it. Hmm. So I think it had an impact to hear, you've seen it before, but in this situation, you know, to see it again where uh, people are using different styles of reflecting back that you think that seeing that within a small group can actually help people go deeper. Yeah, so that's a big question for me is how do we actually kind of go deeper? You know, what's kind of, how can we set that up, uh, you know, to support people in going deeper? And I do, I do have a web page on uh, Brene Brown with a bunch of her quotes and one of you know a couple of her quotes is one is empathy is connection it's a ladder out of the shame hole so um i think that might have been my time i don't know but yeah uh yeah you you um named your curiosity and ex exploration of how do we make it possible and, and inviting for people to go deeper and you also named that you were looking at some Brené Brown quotes and uh, shared an yeah, amazing... And, uh, and I'll just reflect, just it, it, for her, she says, empathy is connection, and it's the ladder out of the shame hole. So, so I thought that was just mm. a nice quote. Yep. So I feel fully heard. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, I'd like to share with Paul. Would you listen? Hmm. 
I've done each, I've done each of the principles so far in the Empathy Cafe. And one of my deepest kind of um, frustration, I think, when I come away from it is how easy it is to get in my five minutes, A, it's never long enough, <laughs> and B, it's, it's easy to get diverted into kind of talking about myself and my engagement with the principle. And, you know, you can, because you can talk about what you like, but I come here with the intention of sharing the way a year and a half, two years of engagement with thinking about how the principles work in action, in Extinction Rebellion. That, that's what I always come with the intention of talking about. And I'm always frustrated when I go away realizing that I've been diverted. <laughs> I've diverted myself. <laughs> so I heard that you've been to all of the principal empathy cafes so far and you were talking about a frustration firstly five minutes isn't long enough but that you did divert your focus towards your own personal experiences of of that particular principle that is what i thought i heard and your intention all along has been to actually share more about how the principles um work within xr because it sounds mm. like you have something to do with them mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and uh, and this one has the the way this one has um, the the difficulty that people have had with engaging with this one for all kinds of reasons has caused a lot of harm within the movement. Are you saying the difficulty that people have had with this particular principle has caused a lot of harm in the movement? Yeah, a lot of hurt, I guess, and, you know, <laughs> more. Um, I, And this is because when it's when somebody clearly does something that could be named as breaking a different principle how do you how do you name that without name, without shaming and blaming them and this is the bit of practice that we don't have in our culture and so it gets so so things get not named or people in their shame go into one of the things they do, which is hide, run away, you know, don't engage with it, lock down, you know, until it, until it shifts. I'll mm. stop there. Yeah. Well, your, your assertion is the reason, one of the reasons behind why it's, it's caused a lot of hurt is because it's inherently quite difficult to, call out a transgression of a principle without um transgressing the principle eight yourself you know by <laughs> shaming them uh, yes. so it's a little bit of a cycle there mm. um and then you were talking about the the reactions that people have if that happens or they see it themselves they go into hiding is one of them mm. So that, so in, in some ways, it's the shame of not being able to name the harm that you see happening that makes people then go into kind of a, a reaction mode that, and this, I, I'm talking definitely from personal experience and observation. Yeah, so you're, you're, what I'm hearing there is that there's a shame you feel yourself about not naming and, you know, sharing whatever transgression there might be yeah and my my reach to uh to find a route through that that wasn't reaching for the systemic 
okay so that see my time's up oh too short next time okay <laughs> thank you you, you can finish that thank sentence, you, April, and then wrap the idea up if you like. You don't okay. need to stop there and then. I would just say that, you know, my reach to try and find an answer to that was by looking at restorative, restorative circles, dialogical systems, rather than reaching into the usual system answers to that. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I wanted to know what it was. The, the route through for you it, well one of them is restorative circles and processes where that, that can be safely shared yeah thank you yeah. thank you paul thank you april um uh marta listening um yeah that's that's thrown up quite a lot for me actually a uh, really interesting inquiry. Um, how can you provide a culture where it's safe to share those things supportively um, without feeling like you're blaming and shaming? So to do it in a way which is really honouring of the relationship and and preserving it and that is there in the way that you do it so it's a rich a rich exploration for you and you're thinking about this idea of um, how can one share um, observations i suppose on uh, things and responsibility without actually causing um, someone to feel shame or it being blaming mm. yeah and i think there's it did it's, it's exactly what well i I heard what april's one of the solution was you know is to have these circles you know these spaces where that's there and then i'm just thinking about my own circle and we we do quite well at this um but i still don't think we do enough um and I've just noticed also that, you know, somebody mentioned something I was doing and I felt shame in the middle of a facilitation role. Um, and that's another big part of this work is to be aware of how that might trigger shame for you, but without blaming that person for bringing it forward. So it's, it's about a cultural shift you're saying and, um, and you, in April, named uh, circles, restorative circles, as a way going about it. And you're thinking in your circle, uh, you've been working on it, but it's you know not quite as good as you'd like it to be yet. You see room for improvement, and you've experienced it when you've been in a role as a facilitator that there have been moments where you experience shame, and then what to do with it, and how to name it in a way where you're not um, giving blame away. The other big area of inquiry, which I'll touch on, is is just how can I express my own vulnerabilities? Because I think that's another great way of um, connecting, really, being open and giving other people opportunity to show empathy. Um, and yeah, just going back to my, my personal issue is there to maybe push, not push, but, you know, have the courage to share these, sh what I feel shameful about so that maybe that can be, um, yeah, more uh, open about that. So you're wondering about yourself and how uh, it shows up for you and the importance of um, being able to model vulnerability because that gives others an opportunity as well to empathize with you and, and to meet you there. Um, and so you're thinking of the sharing of the things that cause shame in you uh, as, as a tool, as a, a handle to explore that connection with another and explore it 
you know, it feels like it's a real antidote uh, to the predominant culture in our world, isn't it? That you know, actually, as a, especially as a man, you don't show your vulnerabilities. You know, you're strong, you're capable. If you work for a hierarchical organization, you've got to show that you're you can handle anything. You don't show your vulnerabilities. Um, we are privileged in exile. We don't have that culture, and we can bring this in a little bit. Um, and then the other thing that occurred to me was around my own shame is that if I'm feeling shamed about something, if I share that, then I might be able to get some help because they might see it a different way and I won't be feeling so much shame. So you're saying uh, two things, that it's anti-cultural, uh, that it's counter-cultural and that it's a bit of an antidote. So the, the counter-cultural piece is that if it's not what's expected of you so in, in normal systems you know especially as, as a man you're you're um supposed to you know compete and and do have these behaviors and that in xr actually there is a different space where you can have give yourself permission uh there's this privilege of actually being able to allow yourself to be vulnerable and and then it's an antidote because if you name shame uh you can be helped and both the being helped and the having named it uh, make it sort of go away or help anyways. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're very heard. Thank you. Um, okay, I spoke to Andy, so now I'll speak to Edwin. <laughs> Edwin? Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Thing. Okay. Ooh. So I'm hearing you want to speak to me because you already spoke to Andy. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's always this thing that you know April was saying. It's like, where, where, where do I want to go? It's like I want to be an octopus. Um, so I want right. to be an octopus. <laughs> mm. Okay. So one thing is that I think these empathy circles and other spaces like this, where we practice our vulnerability. Because it's a thing, empathy and vulnerability are not don't come natural to everyone. Have, some people have very good reasons not, not to be vulnerable and empathic. Very, very good reasons from their life experiences. But it's a skill, and it's a skill that we can train together. It builds connection. It builds community. We can train, and we can get better. And I think the empathy cycles are a part of that. So... Are you saying that uh, we can train our vulnerability, that we can get better at it, and you feel that the empathy circles is, is one way of doing that? And we model, and, and so not just you know participating, but I think anyone in XR that has any role could become an empathy cycle facilitator, because then they can do it and bring it to their groups. Because when I'm an empathy circle facilitator, what I'm doing is I'm modeling vulnerability to others, right? So, um, yeah, I mess up often. And the way I deal with that is I name I've messed up. <laughs> uh, or I'm insecure right now. I'm very sorry. Or like you were saying, Edwin, I need to let you know that I'm doing this other thing. And so I'm not going to be perfect. The moment you name that you're not going to be perfect, that whole shame trigger associated with this idea I need to be perfect sort of goes away. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of two parts to it. One was uh, that uh, any sort of leader in XR or group leader could do become a facilitator in, in empathy circles and kind of spread that. And the other is that it's by really the naming of what's going on in oneself that one maybe is ashamed of or just whatever is alive in you. And if when you bring it out, it kind of takes the shame out of it or it transforms the shame by naming it. So it's the importance of naming what's going on in, in you. I feel I could talk about this for a whole hour. Uh -huh. But if I show up naked on a square, I and mean, we wouldn't do that because it'd be a distraction and people wouldn't understand the message, right? So I'm not thinking, talking about physically naked, I'm talking about emotionally naked, right? Because otherwise people get confused. But if I show up naked, if I show up on at the TD's door um, at work, you know, not in his <laughs> their private life, and, and I try to engage with them in a vulnerable place, whatever that means to me, 
that's incredibly powerful. That's almost irresistible. But I can't do that and blame and shame them at the same time. Mm. So it's, uh, it's very powerful to show up uh, emotionally naked, emotionally sort of open. And you can't be open and blaming and shaming at the same time. They're sort of mm. opposites. To, or... to clarify, I'm not talking about manipulation, right? Like uh -huh. there's that piece. People can be emotionally manipulative. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking standing in my own truth. Uh, it's not about, yeah, it's, it's a tricky boundary, but it's, a, you know, but it's standing in my own truth. And I think because we've tried all the rational arguments with politicians, with people in power, with business leaders, like we've tried the rational thing over and over again, and we should keep trying, right? But there's something else. There's this seduction game. It's like almost we need to, you've tried that. Is it working for you? Are you happy in your life? I don't think so. Let's try and be happier together. I think, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, it's like you would like to have a sort of a, a vulnerability approach to uh, expressing yourself versus uh, trying to convince people through argument and sort of reason. Uh, because the reasoning hasn't really worked. Uh, and so let's try, I want to try vulnerability, being open, being truthful about what's, what I'm experiencing. Yeah, and empathy is, and my time's up, empathy is the tool. That's, mm -hmm. you know, vulnerability is the window, but empathy is the tool. Yeah, the, the, there's the, the vulnerability is that openness, and the, the way to create that is through empathy. Thank you, Edwin. I feel very oh, Yeah. I'll speak to Andy. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, the, uh, I see the empathy circle, what we're doing here as I, you know, I'm thoroughly with Martha on this, that this is sort of that, the practice, like a gateway practice for what we're trying to create through, for, you know, op more vulnerability. I, I know that uh, that as time goes on and I feel a sense, I hear other people hear me, it does allow me to open up more. So it's, you know, as, as I develop more trust with, with uh, from others that I know oh, they're going to hear me and not, yeah, and not necessarily judge me first thing. Judge me afterwards, but <laughs> first listen. <laughs> Okay, um, so in order to get into this kind of um, empathy space that um, I'm aiming for, um, I find the empathy circle is the is the way in, and um, and in that space um, we don't judge each other, and I think that's the most important thing that we we empathize, which means not judging. Yeah, and it's even in the if I do judge you, I say, Andy, you're an idiot. You're a, you're a jerk. You're you're no good. So even if I judge you, I'll get a reflection back, which sort of transforms the judgment. Um, so, in the empathy circle, of course, I could be abusive, um, but then the mirror will show show me what the effect of that is and then i have to face up to it yeah and it and it's sort of yeah it's sort of there's a transformation that happens in there i've noticed that uh that i you know i do sort of these mediations with the political left and right and you know sometimes they're they just you know people are kind of name calling and everything and i actually find it kind of interesting for people to name call and then to really just reflect back and get what here what's sort of behind that you know, it's uh, actually, it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of entertaining <laughs> at some level, you know, just to be able to reflect back, this is really what's going on for you. And then it actually kind of transforms the, the, the judgments and the, because once people feel heard, there's sort of a, a connection that happens. So, um, yeah, I have this experience from various, uh, empathy circles I do with left and right people sort of trying to mediate them and in that process I often witness that 
they would call each other out and then um, they would get reflected back and this itself is transformation and when I observe this it really turns me on I, I really I really I find it fun actually just to be part of that and to witness that yeah it's uh, when they're judging me <laughs> it's like when they're name calling me and judging me and you know if I can have the space I don't always have it to just reflect that back in the here that that's the part that's really a lot of fun that to have that oh. capacity. I don't always have it but when I do it's it's something I'm trying to yeah try to do more try, try to uh, get better at so um yeah I'm in the role of mediator, but actually sometimes I get the flack. And then that itself is quite an ex important experience for me. And maybe it's transformative for me. Yeah, and then there, yeah. And so the empathy circles are just a sort of a container for sort of the boot camp, you know, for doing that. And, and there was some other things too that, uh, oh, I think this tied in with what Paul was saying that, uh, that, you know, you or I think April too. That if you tell someone, "Hey, you're breaking this rule or whatever," you're one of the principles. And then, how do you do that in a non-judgmental way? That if the person you're speaking to is familiar with empathy, they can just empathize with you, and that sort of transforms it. You know, so I, I that's where I was going. It's it's the relational aspect that I hear a lot about. Oh, you know, I have to do this. I have to do this. But there's the aspect of the relationship that if we have an empathic relationship there, if there's that mutuality, I think that that's what really helps. Not just, I have to be empathic as an individual, but really we need an empathic society where we're mutually willing to have an agreement that we want, want to do this mutually. So um, <clears throat> fundamentally, I feel that empathy is the key to undermining the whole blame culture. And the empathy circle is a very suitable container within which we train, like in a boot camp, in order to develop that capacity. And then eventually, we would like to have a society where this is the dominant culture. Yeah, there, it's a, there's a mutuality to it. Not Yeah, that, that mutuality, I really wanted to hear that. Yeah, we, we, we exchange with each other and, and we share and then we're, we're helping each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel heard. Thanks. Okay. So um, maybe I could um, choose April. Would you be willing to listen to me? It would be an honor. Um, Thank you. Okay. So um, one thing that's come up for me in listening to everybody is um, the idea of blame the action, not the person. And uh, it's something which I think is quite valid. And um, because there are certain negative actions that we do. But in order to practice that, you have to actually love the person. And w when you love the person, then you can't blame them uh, you, you, because you understand them. Uh, I suppose maybe when I say love, I mean empathy. Um, but you know, love is something even more powerful than empathy for me. Uh, when you love somebody, then you see it from their side. And, um, but nevertheless, they can do an action which you, you think is wrong or mistaken. And I think there's a way of saying that within the love. Mm. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I heard that you uh, feel that what stirred in you in listening to everyone else was that there, there was a way to step into this space and that was to separate the person from the way they're behaving or their actions and that if you name the actions as the hurtful or damaging behavior that can separate it from the shame element yeah um i mean i mentioned in previously that you know, I can blame capitalism without blaming capitalists. And um, coming back to this um, calling out the action within love, I think there's an issue about ego. I think that um, if we come from a position of low or, you know, let's say minimal ego, 
then um, we're not in a fight. Um, but nevertheless, we can compassionately explain what we think is wrong with the way somebody's behaving. Mm. Mm. Of course, the chunk that I missed in your first bit was naming the love as being uh, necessary for you to be able to step out of that. And you gave the example of being able to name capitalism as a harmful action, harmful behavior, but not necessarily the capitalist. Uh, and also linked empathy uh, intrinsically within love, but love being bigger, more than that, as a bigger step. Oh, sorry. Eek. So I, I, I suppose um, to generate or evolve a culture which is fundamentally based on love um, would naturally uh, mean forgiveness, uh, reconciliation, um, and moving on from harmful actions. But harmful actions need to be identified in the process and uh, not aggressively, of course, but uh, nevertheless, we have to have a critique of what is harmful. Otherwise, we can't leave it behind, I don't think. Mm. I heard that uh, in order to step powerfully into this place of loving each other, there has to be to be, and I heard three things named as forgiveness, uh, mm, rep so reparation, um, restorate, and I'd lost that, reconciliation, thank you, and, uh, and finding a route to naming the harmful action, the harmful behaviours yeah, in so a compassionate way. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, so starting with myself, my task with myself is to try to take my ego out of my interactions as much as possible and thereby I can become a clearer and purer mirror for others, which I think is what this empathy circle is all about, is mirroring uh, the person that you're listening to. And that way we can have the function that Paul uh, sorry, Edwin described, of um, uh, defusing the, uh, the aggression. Mm. So I heard for, from you, for you, the key is to be able to take your ego out of the engagements in order to become uh, more uh, aligned or more uh, congruent mirror reflection back. Um, and that this is a practice that embodies that, gives practice in that, um, and allows us to get to the naming of the harmful behaviors without aggression. Yeah, so um, empathy uh, uh, at its best is a kind of mirroring, and that means mirroring even the people that we totally disagree with at a certain level. It doesn't mean that uh, we identify with uh, their uh, negative behavior, but we mirror their, their, their purest part. Mm. Okay, so I'm hearing that you feel that it's uh, really important to be able to step into that space within empathy of even the person that you disagree with uh, in order, it, it, I'm not quite clear whether it's the empathy comes first or the understanding that then creates the empathy allowing connection. Uh, I, I think I'm saying that being an empathic mirror mm. first, right. you know, if I look at Donald Trump, okay. for instance, who I fundamentally disagree with, mm -hmm. there's something pure within Donald Trump. And coming from that space, I can still be critical of 
the behaviors which I disagree with without rejecting him fundamentally. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. 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 Thank you. That's yeah. Idea. And okay, I still get to reflect it so that you, and just to say, um, yeah, you, so fundamentally it's important to be able to step into that empathic reflection space in order to uh, make that connection for the flow of love, of understanding and empathy. Yeah, so th thank you very much, April, for really working hard with me, and I'm sorry it was so complex. <laughs> no, thank you. It's not, yeah, no, I mean, and I'm, you know, really, um, I'm so interested uh, in everybody's unfolding of what it means to them. Um, oh, I'd love, okay. Uh, I will, I'll go to Edwin then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Circulate round. Okay, so. You're the, really interested in the unfolding from everyone, really, what, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I'm really, <sighs> within Extinction Rebellion, we hang on to this kind of, uh, this emergency messaging that provokes and, and uh, drives action, action, action. So you're, you're noticing that within Extinction Rebellion, there's this, uh, emergency aspect that uh, pushes and drives action and action 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 it's just ongoing action energy and so many people are uh speak up for the part that they know that's about the shared community responsibility for doing this vulnerability work, this empathy work, this personal engagement with what limits us. So, there's, the, there's a part of the community is seeing the value of, of uh, empathy and, and so these, these limits that we have, I'm not sure if I really understood that, but these I, the limits there, we have. I guess that, oh, Engaging with empathy, forming deep connection, sharing vulnerability uh, has the, the beautiful gift of making us aware of the limitations of the system that we've been brought up in, inherited, been parented in. These, this personal work makes it makes us aware of the benefits. This is part of the prosperity. If we're a pop-up community sharing risk by lying in the road and taking action, the prosperity of it is the personal shift in uh, the ability to get rid of the ego or to um, really listen, cry with someone, sit and see their view. Uh, is it that if we're ha if we have this empathic connection with with others in, by doing actions in other ways that that gives us more awareness of the lack of that in the larger society? Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, okay. Part of it, so not quite all of it. Uh -huh. If if we're you know being driven by the emergency messaging and we know that the personal sort of the personal I don't want to say development but that kind of engagement with our the, the responsibility to uh, step into the spaces to practice vulnerability and empathy and therefore form deeper connection that takes longer there's all there's loads of built in resistance in people. So, you know, well, actually actions sometimes become a distraction for doing that. Mm. So to, to create these deeper connections, to have this vulnerability, to have this empathy, it takes time. And, it, you know, you have to do this, uh, this work to create.
create that. And the, the action component of just driving, pushing, actually kind of distracts from that deeper connection, deeper empathy, deeper vulnerability. Certainly sometimes it can it do. It can. Uh -huh. So what, what I'm, for instance, like there's a, right now there's a rising this, uh, I saw uh, some XR people and there was discussion about race, racism, classism, uh, the polarities of that and how that is the problem at the root of environmentalist movements. Um, what are we going to do about that? Mm, so you just heard some recent comments about racism and it being sort of at the root of the, of the environmental problems, that that's sort of like, they're saying that that's the core of it and how are we going to address that? Yeah, it wasn't just comments. I mean, it was learned people who are, you know, at, who have done lots of deep thinking and it was a, a, an interview and lots of unfolding, two hours of fascinating, really rich listening. However, what it said was <laughs> the way to unite us, and it's, it's typical Machiavellian thinking, the way to unite all these people who are arguing over class or race, it doesn't matter what you name mm -hmm. it, but you know, you keep naming all these isms, is to identify the real enemy. The real enemy is the elites. Mm -hmm. And so the, for me, phew, whoa, big distraction. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're feeling pretty, I, I hear you're some, you're upset about this sort of this strategy and this mindset that <clears throat> you're hearing that it's, uh, the problem is racism and classism, and we have to unite people against the, the, the elites. And it's, uh, yeah, and you just see that as, uh, you're kind of maybe feeling frustrated about that strategy and that, that way of. Can I name one more sentence? Yeah, because uh, frustration sure. uh -huh. isn't enough. Okay. I, I recognize that, that as, a as a mass mobilization tool, that will work. Armies have used it for years we're looking for something much deeper, you know, a mm -hmm. transformational step for humanity. This is not enough. This, we are stepping way beyond that. Everything, you know, is aligning for us to do that. And this is a distraction. Yeah, so that whole approach of, you know, finding the common enemy is really a distraction. People have been doing that for forever. Yeah. And you're really wanting something deeper, really something more fundamental. And this is sort of the time for that. Yes, thank you. I do feel well heard. Thank you. Uh, Paul, can I speak to you? Yep. Yeah, I, I uh, feel that for in myself. Uh, um, what uh, April is from what April is saying I, that there's a deeper shift that can uh, happen that needs to happen and that's uh, why I've really enjoyed working with you in the future democracy hubs I think that that's kind of pointing in the in the direction that uh, I want to go uh, so you're really resonating with April's uh, sharing of a deeper a need for a deeper shift and um, that's one of the reasons why you've enjoyed engaging with the future democracy. Yeah because it's been open to this empathic direction which I see as the other direction it's not it's not having a common enemy right it's really hearing everybody hearing all the sides and then I think the thing that's different is not just I'm going to go listen to everybody it's that you know you really need a culture where where that becomes uh, that we're going to listen to each other. It's not and I, because I hear it all the time. Oh, I do all this empathy. I listen to people and I get burned out, and then I don't want to do any more empathy. It's it's really about insisting that we, it's a cultural shift. We need a cultural shift, and I do see you know there's this thread within XR that I think kind of sees that, it's like April, right? It's like sees that there's this deeper shift that can happen. And there's multiple spectrums within XR. You know, there's the, the one that April's talking about. We got to go blame somebody and have our common enemy. But there's also this other thread that I think we're trying to develop that, that way of being. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. excited about that. I feel I have some hope. 
with this group here. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of energy and excitement um, for this empathic direction. And you're also saying that you know, this, this is a fundamental principled shift that we're looking for in the culture uh, where everybody is heard. It's not just, you know, the people we like. Um, and that cultural shift is needed. But you also notice what April was saying is that there are threads of that in XR, but there's also threads of this other. Let's, let's kind of gang up on this group, uh, which you don't feel is it. Yeah, and uh, I think that's the other part of what we're doing here is we've done, uh, we've done some empathy cafes on empathic direct action. So it's taking what we're doing and the demand becomes to the power, th those elites that they're trying to blame, but it to demand that they take part in an empathy circle, right? It's like, hey, you know, prime minister, president, you know, senators, re representatives, we would like an empathy circle, you know, CEOs of Chase Manhattan or the Shell or whatever, we would like an empathy circle with you. So it's kind of like the means are the end. So the means that we're using here is actually the means that is the ends that we kind of get. And out of that, you know, can hopefully flow some, you know, shared uh, direction for society. So the, the three word phase, phrase you mentioned was empathic direct action. And the, what I heard was a, a, a calling rather than a, no blaming and shaming or a naming of these elites or whatever they whatever group it is you call them to take part in an empathy circle and it's like you're offering a process uh that in itself would facilitate the kind of connections that we think is at the heart of um of of what we think is needed and yeah. the means will really bring the ends that we're looking for yeah, it's a, it's just like XR says, so let's have, a, and what you're working with too, is let's have a citizen's assembly. You know, it's like, we don't know what's going to emerge out of the citizen's assembly. We just know that we trust people that when they come together and hear each other, that, and every voice is heard, that there will be a, you know, something, whatever comes out of it, it it'll be with everyone's voice uh, uh, included so yeah so that that's where kind of my hope my direction my passion you know it is directed so i heard you re reference another you know well tried and tested process the citizens assembly uh as another process uh, that is inherently trusting the people and you know we're not imposing our will on our, our, our agenda on that we're just saying here's the process and here's the people let them get on with it yeah and there's a lot of other tools and practices that you know to be added to it but this is just sort of a, a first step but i think it can be if we can you know at least that's what i'm working towards is engaging the different uh you know powers that be in in empathy circles so that's one of the big and i got all and i have tons of ideas about it <laughs> not enough to share it i don't have time to share it all here Again, I'm hearing a lot of energy, enthusiasm, and joy and love coming over uh, for the for the empathy circles, but also the the other tools in the toolkit that um, are all about this engaging. Yeah, and yeah, there's just not enough time to share it all. Go on, yeah, we have another go. <laughs> I feel hurt. Thanks, Val. Marvelous. Uh, Andy. Yeah, okay, here we are. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's so much, so much to go on since I last spoke. Um, so um, just th this vision of the, uh, the, the empathy actions, we've, we've tried, I think Mar Marty was saying, we've tried logic, doesn't work and well what what else what else would work and what what would that look like um and yeah I just get feel a lot of excitement around around that we talked about it before i know i know i had conversations with you edwin about it um yeah 
So it feels like there's visions reforming around that and what that might look like. So the conversation's really moved a long way since I last spoke. And um, what I'm really feeling and getting into is uh, this uh, possibility of empathy as um, the way forward. And yeah, I've had conversations with Edwin about many sort of possibilities here. And uh, there's a lot of excitement. I'm feeling uh, really kind of inspired by this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I've really related to these threads of um, where this is not happening, Alex R. And are they just going back to the, the intervention that those in those places is is well maybe there are many but certainly bringing in these processes which we know inherently facilitate empathy but then the other thing i was exploring earlier which i might go into a bit more is this how can i show my own vulnerability and i do experiment with this a little bit and just playing around with it so what's the effect of it um if i say for example see somebody ganging up on the CEOs of the oil companies, whatever it might be, I express how that makes me feel. Okay, so um, there's two things. One is um, that I'm, I've been hearing and I, I, I can relate to this point about those people in XR who don't seem to yet get it about the empathy, but also then I come back to myself and uh, how I function in situations where people are calling out the CEOs of oil companies, that kind of thing. And uh, how I relate to that is part of my development. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm just reflecting on that question. How, how do I show my own vulnerability? Um, and what's the trigger to remind me to go deeper and i'm just exploring it now and it, what comes is this it's a feeling trigger really i think if i'm feeling uh, say hurt then i can share my vulnerability at that point because i am vulnerable so it's it's a natural process potentially. I'm also wondering where I don't react in that way, and where there's more awareness to be be sought. So um, the challenge for me is to connect with my own vulnerability, and when I go deep inside. Uh, I can access it, and uh, at, at that point, I do con connect with some deep pain. Um, but then there are situations in my life where I seem to be out of touch with it. Yeah, so I'm thinking about some of those meetings I'm sometimes in. Um, and where this um, kind of shows up. Um, where it doesn't feel like that's present. Um, and I know well, one, one thing I have done is, is shared how it makes me feel. Um, but I still recognized there was some hurt and a little bit of resentment there. So that indicates to me there's a little bit more work to do. So the kind of situation where I discovered that part of me that um, is out of touch with my vulnerability would be in certain meetings. Um, and um, I, I can share how it's making me feel and and then I realize that I've got more work to do, more personal work. 
Thanks, Andy. Thanks. I'm fully heard. Okay. Um, so I'm going to choose Marta to uh, listen to me, if that's okay. Listening. Um, so I want to reflect on the beauty that I experienced in this uh, conversation. Um, it's um, it really touches me at a deep level. So I'm expressing appreciation to everybody. Thank you. So you're sitting with beauty that you feel and uh, there's gratitude and appreciation for people here. What does this experience? Um, this reflects what uh, Edwin said about the empathy circle being a container for this process that we are talking about. Uh, in this conversation and um, as I said at the beginning this is my first empathy circle and it has been proven to me that it is a suitable container for this process it's not the only one I know but it's definitely a good one from my point of view so yeah um, you, you're seeing it's your first empathy circle but you're seeing that as Edwin had pointed out it's a, not probably not the only one but it's a suitable container for this kind of uh, exploration and embodying this um, and I guess one of the challenges for me is the scale that we're working in a group of five people and uh, of course there are quite a lot there are half a dozen such groups going on simultaneously um, but still, in terms of transforming society, uh, this is a good method, but it, it can't be as the sole method. Mm -hmm. So one of the um, problems you're sort of thinking about is the scalability of it. Uh, because, of course, you know, it, it can be multiplied many units, most, many small units, but to actually create uh, transformations in the whole society, um, need other methods as well. So... Uh, Ever since I joined XR, I've been involved in the regen culture side of XR, and we use different methods. And um, for me, it connects with uh, the way that I try to be all the time. And I think that, for instance, you can be empathic when you're walking down the street. You don't have to be in an empathy circle. Yeah, so you're within XR, very involved with the regenerative culture practices side. And you're saying that even, you know, that an individual like you do that, they you can embody it in your day-to-day -day when you're walking down the street, so you don't necessarily need this format. You can just uh, do it all the time. So I see XR as a whole as a kind of training ground for a, um, for, for a new wave of people who, uh, in their many ways, in many parts of the world, are going to transform the world. Oh, well, they're already transforming the world, actually. So you see it that it's something that everyone in XR uh, can do is, is to embody um, such a culture and it's one way to transform the world that is available yeah. to it. Yeah, thank you. And um, of course, XR isn't alone. There are, there are other organizations and movements uh, working parallel and together we are going to bring about uh, a, a different world culture and whether on we're not going to, I don't think we're going to stop the the climate change, but I do think that we're going to rescue um, the world, the the society from a disaster. Mm. Um, so XR is not alone. There's other groups it's working alongside with, and uh, even you're hopeful. You, you're not, you know, even if we don't um, solve the whole climate. Uh, change problem we're still going to embody a different world and, and create change that way um, and it's it's not surprising that some of the aggressive elements from the activist movement have found their way into xr it's completely understandable and it's important that we don't blame them and that we actually uh, work with them on an empathic level in whatever context we're in meetings or on actions or wherever we are so it only makes sense that uh, we'd have uh, the more um, aggressive sides of activism also uh, join XR. It's only natural and it's you know, um, sh um, turning towards them with empathy 
uh, and an understanding and sort of working uh, together to shift that. Thank you very much, Meta. You were great. Thank you, Amit. Um, About four okay. minutes left. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who's not being longest? Um, maybe I'll speak to you, April. That's okay. Um, yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Oh God, can I continue some other time? I've got such a big list of things to get through. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I do think Brené Brown, definitely, and Adri, Adrian uh, Murray Brown, and lots of other people, and Sarah Payton, I feel like, I don't know if you know Sarah Payton, she's, um, because there's this component of self-parenting, um that i think is really important to bring to the movement not as personal work necessarily but this whole thing of short feedback loops that we talk about sounds like a really nice idea mm. but we don't know how to do that and so we need to self-parent and help parent each other so we can actually do the short feedback loops that we talk about. Mm. Thank you. I heard you name three authors that you felt were uh, important to Anne, particularly mentioned Sarah Payton and the work on self-parenting that uh, you think is important um, in order to collectivize the responsibility for uh, sharing this growth. Yeah. And acknowledging the neurobiology. You know, I think it's really important. I can want to do something. You know, I can want to try and be angry in a productive way. I can want to withhold judgment. I can want all these things. But unless I really work on the neurobiology of it in me and together, our collective, then I'm just going to be triggered and there's not much I can do about that. Mm. I heard an acknowledgement of uh, the importance of understanding the neurobiology and the differences uh, between us uh, and the kind of helplessness if we don't root ourselves in reaching for that level of understanding, then we're kind of helpless to our traumatic behaviors. And we won't be able to remain nonviolent as well, which is, it's a big worry for me. And it's, I hear, it's a deep concern that without that work, we won't be able to stay nonviolent. Yeah. Mm. And I suppose part of it as well is to, we're all humans. And like, you know, the people Andy was mentioning, some of like the aggressive activists, they're also our elders. So, you know, they've been trying for a very long time to create change, many of them. So empathizing with them is also giving them the due acknowledgement sometimes. And sometimes mm -hmm. maybe we need to help them with this parenting bit, you know, so that they see our side of it, so that we can see each other. Um, you know, it's, yeah, so it's acknowledging them and helping them see us by seeing them. Mm. Mm. I heard that leap of connection, acknowledging that not only are these, as Andy named, the kind of older activists rooted in things, uh, the, the, the antagonists in some cases, but they are also our elders, uh, those with the experience to share and that if we can help them, if we can sit alongside and, and find a, an empathic connection, then we have a lot to learn from each other. Yeah. And my last idea is just then, if we do that, then we won't be in this separation you know, that and, and this whole 
yeah, we'll be able to a bit more non-dualistic, I suppose, if we manage to. It's not just the othering might stop. I suppose that's it. The othering might stop. So that's one place that the othering might stop if we can apply that uh, technique. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for getting back Very here. Very hard. <laughs> uh, it is a bit clunky, but uh, I have another way to message uh, Edwin. So if just to let people know, if they want to come back in, if they're kicked out or their computer crashes, you know, log back in. And then uh, what I will show the facilitators will try to do is give a, a message to Edwin to let you know you're in the waiting room and then put you back in. So Thank the, you. That's just yeah. it. Sir. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for explaining that, Bill. Are we all back, more or less? Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, I don't know about you, I had a lovely time. <laughs> so, uh, Anne, you had her finger up. Anne? Anne? You're muted. You're muted. It's Angie back, who was in my group. I think everybody's and, back. This, and this, Nika, okay. The rooms have all closed, so. Can't see her there now. Can anybody see? Um, John or Mika? John's no. there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. John's there. there. So it's yeah. just Angie yeah. then. Okay. We've lost Angie. Okay. So we've got, uh, yeah, we've got just under uh, half an hour. So I suppose we'll all have been on different journeys um so what we'll thank you for that i see see you again too <laughs> um yeah so before uh we go i suppose it might help to have a share in this bigger group so we can hear from each other um and harness some learning maybe and also there might be something that you need to say and name before you feel complete or uh, yeah, or a brilliant idea you want to continue discussing some other time, whichever it is that is important to you right now. So um, I suppose half an hour is 30 of us, so I'd ask everyone to be mindful of maybe we have under a minute for each. Um, but yeah, so maybe I'll call on you, it might be easier. I'll just go around my screen and do it that way. And uh, first person on my screen is Ro Dai. Sorry, there's not much I can say because um, my system crashed. And then when I got back, you know, obviously nobody, nobody was able to, I don't know how the system works, but uh, so I, I was here on the outside, but never mind. I, I'm sure you all got on very well, and uh, I look forward to hearing how other people reported. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Ro. That's very sad and unfortunate, but look forward to sharing with you uh, again soon. Um, so Edwin, will you go next? Yeah, uh, I really uh, enjoyed the, our call. It seemed like this wasn't enough time, could have uh, gone for another hour. It seemed like we were just sort of touching on the edge of like real uh, insightful sort of topics. And uh, I, I just feel like I have all this stuff to say as well as follow up. Yeah, so need more time. <laughs> so yeah, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, Bill? Um, oh, I had a really great time. I was very impressed by the talent and the skill of my group, uh, everybody in the group, and was really appreciative and um, of the depth and, uh, of the sharing that went on. So I was really appreciative. Hope to see everybody again. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. And uh, Angie Polke. Are you there, Angie? Hello, 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 hello. Sorry, I have poor broadband. 
Um, yeah, I was very struck by um, by what I learned from how each person held held the listening and the reflecting back, and uh, it, each in their own ways, um, which when, and each were all fine. And it was as somebody who's normally trying to so hard to get things right. It was just lovely to see that process unfold and reiterate and for us to get more comfortable or certainly me get more comfortable as time went by. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Um, Margaret? We um, had a, a great um, dialogue. Um, and um, it was, I appreciated that we had a lot of people from different parts of the world, you know, US, Canada, Canada, Ireland, um, and England. But, um, and uh, those different viewpoints, I thought, were, came across quite strongly. And we ended on um, a point, I thought, that, um, you know, even people in XR UK are unconsciously still perhaps we still have a colonial mentality that it's unconscious and that perhaps we should be aware of it. But uh, it was great. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Marguerite. Uh, Greg Corning. Thank you. Um, yeah, I thought it was very good. Um, it was, um, this is my second time doing this uh, cafe and um, uh, I feel like I'm, kind of learning how much learning I have to do about how to listen. And uh, I spoke in our group about my tendency, it's possibly a white male thing, to try to, at least in my mind, listen to somebody, but try to nudge them in a direction I want their speech to go, so as they'll reaffirm my worldview. So I, that's a lot of work to be done uh, to kind of change that and learn how to listen and just shut up and listen. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much. Um, Ella Chesterman. Hello. Um, I loved the group and I loved our most diverse conversations. Uh, everything from the plants we're growing to intersectionality um, and books. So I, I just thought it was fabulous and just a pleasure to work with uh, people in my group. Thank you. It was great learning. Thank you, Ella. Uh, Jamie. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, it was really good. Um, I feel like starting to stray uh, from the idea of like, you know, the principle, but it was really, it was really interesting, like the whole conversation about like, kind of like, colonialism and indigenous peoples um yeah it was really interesting but before that um when we were talking uh about the actual principle uh yeah i really kind of like i really got i really felt quite reaffirmed in my kind of like perception of it as a like inherently the kind of like right and like almost like moral way to like operate uh, for us, um, so that was quite nice <laughs> to have my beliefs confirmed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I re no, I really like it. Uh, thank you, to everyone in my group. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Sophia. Yeah, I think it was lovely. Uh, I love this topic. We talked about self-blame and putting the responsibility and where it belongs. And then we went on to right and wrong and roomy quotes. And then we ended up in sort of like, uh, oh, I have to, the, the notion that we all um, uh, have this need to get the, our reflex, reflections right. And that was a kind of, um, yeah, I, I, I felt a sense of relief 
and just and voicing that that oh we we need we have this need to get the reflections right and then there's the, this guilt and if we don't and yeah i i thought it was lovely thank you sophia um john Heyman's mika yes that's me um hi yeah i am just glad to be here and yeah I, I came from an xr group in the US, united states that's pretty pretty normal and yeah i pretty pretty low-key we we don't do that much right we haven't done that much since the pandemic which is when i started getting active in them but yeah there are lots of interesting people in this movement and i got to learn about different perspectives and different views of the world and it was exciting Thank you all for, for, for regardless of whether you were in my group or, yeah, this was amazing. I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Lika. Uh, Ella Chesterman. Hello, I've already um, had my minute. Oh, sorry, Ella. <laughs> yeah, I just want to make sure everybody gets their turn. And, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, it was my bad. Um, uh, Sally Roadman. Well, I, we had a great group. Um, I, uh, really, um, you know, was just so curious. We had a woman from Korea. I think this was her first time and wow, it was so cool getting people from places, you know, all over the world. And um, I just um, really wanted to hear from everyone. And, um, you know, um, I didn't really do a lot of talking, but um, I think that I did maybe too much in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> but um, I think it's probably the biggest problem that we need to deal with, um, with XR and maybe different um, aspects of um, this topic um, could be uh, explored. Um, and that's, you know, kind of my read on it because it's just so complicated to not be in the IU and us them mode that is so hard to get out of. It just, we're trapped. And that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, Kevin, Guyan. Hi. Um, yeah, it was a great call today. Um, a lot of a uh, lot of great discussions in our room. Um, I really appreciate uh, the time that we spent. <clears throat> Talked about competition and and how competition is uh drives us against each other instead of making us unified was one of the things that we talked about and and the blaming and shaming of how we you know we still do it so anyways i really appreciate this uh, process and welcome everyone for being here thank you thank you kevin Shane Kim. Yeah, I am uh, nice to see all you guys here. I'm from Korea. It's first time for me to participate in these sessions. And I got very impressed about the openness of uh, talkings and also even first time meet some people in groups. Then I feel like uh, 
I also can speak something uh, from deep from deep inside of my mind. So I got surprised about myself also that I can talk such a things. And also very thankful to make this the space to be safe to make a mistake and uh, to talk what I trying to talk. And I really feel hold. Then the judgments that I have in my mind that I would like to give uh, something like uh, advice and these things, pressing of those things is something big issue in me. <laughs> That's where I felt also when I'm doing this uh, practice. So I really impressed about this and I hope that I can participate next time also. Thank you. Can you hear us? You were muted, Martha. Okay, sorry, uh, Dean in Plymouth? Yes, uh, Plymouth here. Yeah. Blaming and shaming uh, serves the divide and conquer toxic system and keeps the hierarchy in situ. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Hester in London. Thank you, Marta. Um, yeah, that was one of the things that came up in our group as well, Dean. Um, I really appreciated how diverse our, our conversation became. We spoke about, um, you know, personal interactions. We spoke about judging and shaming whole groups of people. We spoke about the shame. Um, I've, I spoke about the shame I feel um, as a mother when I'm when I, I take my attention away from my children to be an activist or to work, um, I, I have been shamed. Um, I have judged myself. I then judge others for shaming me. Uh, and it, the vicious circle goes round and round. I called it the blame and shame merry-go-round. It's been very apt. Uh, I've been part of two very big disputes within working groups in XR this week. It all circles around blame, shame and power. Um, so it was wonderful to make the connections, it was wonderful to hear the stories and to, um, to receive the, the authentic responses this evening. And we have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much, Hester. Um, yeah, so Shan? Thank you, and thank you to the group I was in. Um, yeah, I'm left with um, lots of thoughts, really, which is really beneficial. I liked the way we started with the personal and then sort of expanded out and expanded in and continued to do that. And I think I'm left at the moment just thinking about how blaming and shaming really polarises and stops people getting alongside each other, whatever their beliefs or systems or thoughts are and I just think that's very important to connect with the people rather than judge them and I think I can learn a lot. Mm. Thank you Sharon. MJ in Amsterdam. Yeah, um, very insightful conversation I think. Um, seems the blaming and we concluded the blaming and shaming drives from a form of hate, whereas if we can prevent that, we can act more on love and empathy. Um, uh, I've had a like, perhaps thought since, um, which could be food for thought, is that um, when Greta was saying, how dare you, perhaps that was a form of... Um, Blaming and shaming, which we could note and move on from. Um, yeah. Thank you, Carolina, Dean, um, Karen, Miguel, and Maureen. Thank you, MJ. Uh, Maureen O'Connor? Uh, uh, yes, uh, one of the reflections I would have at the end of it was something 
there was an expression that uh, maybe as members of XR, we have a very good atmosphere in our groups. And uh, joining in a conversation where members of XR are there, there is that atmosphere of um, togetherness and, and a good community sense and uh, the sense of oneness that is kind of bringing the members together and i suppose that will be the last i think that's very important it's kind of the base on which all of our activism will flow thank you to everybody in my group thank you thank you maureen andy Bistrate. so um I think our group was a really excellent uh, arena. Uh, a lot of deep sharing happened. Uh, there was some useful discussion about XR, about the, sometimes the divergence between uh, the activist strand and the empathic strand. Um, and uh, I found it very helpful that discussion and um, I was really pleased about the connection between the empathy circle and future democracy and it, it the, the, the discussion contributes to my optimism thank you thank you Andy and James I brought some of my criticisms to my group trying to bring it without blaming and shaming. I'm not sure if I succeeded. Um, when I hear a group of people agreeing and um, saying that everything is wonderful, almost 100%, I get a little suspicious. Um, I, um, I worry that if disagreement is not tolerated, that um, it becomes difficult to distinguish real uh, from fake agreement. And um, so my project is in doing that without blaming and shaming, uh, which I don't always find easy. I don't find that easy to do here, uh, but that's what I am doing. So I have, I have criticisms about what happens here and I wanted to say that. Thank you, James. Um, Susan Sadie? Hi, yeah, um, I find, I find this whole, I mean, empathy is like a, it's an active, it's more than a word, isn't it? It's an active thing and how that it leads to reduce separation. And I'm really grateful to my little group because, you know, that thing, it's, it's, it's not only being heard, um, and heard in a, by a, a person or people listening to you, but it's also that thing of listening. And uh, what a wonderful gift it is to be able to listen and to identify. You know that saying of like, um, you know, empathy is like uh, uh, walking a mile in someone else's shoes. Now we had, you know, five minute goes with each other. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, walking a mile in someone else's shoes. So really, really um, allowing ourselves to just go more deeply into this wonderful experience. Um, empathy is a, is a fine, fine, it is an experience. And I thank you all for that. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Paul T. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed the session. Uh, it just struck me, and I was in our group, uh, the the fundamental nature of this principle and what we do in empathy circles uh, to everything we do in XR and what's needed in the world seems fundamental. And if there's any othering of people, then that's more of the same of what's got us to the problems that we've got and we're trying, we're trying to take on. And there was a really, well, what I kind of wanted to explore in the group was 
my how I respond if I'm feel shame myself or I I've been shamed. Um, and what I explore is how expressing my own vulnerabilities will be an antidote to that, so people can see see me and and how that's not, not easy thing to do, and especially it's easier in a culture like this. It's not so easy in other other environments, but it feels like that's the one of the areas that's really worth exploring. To what extent that that changes that cycle of blame, um, and one of the inquiries I've got is is do I always spot it? And I don't think I I always spot it, but there's times when I do, and then I can intervene. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Karin. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, we have. Uh, I have a great time as well. Uh, like uh, like the, since the beginning, and uh, we talk about the blaming and shaming. Maybe it's part of a culture or education, but uh, there was something we were we discovered is that we are one. We are one together, and uh, we are sharing the same vision that uh, we have to build this community all together. And uh, maybe empathy circles can can be helpful for stop blaming and shaming. Thank you for everything. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Carolina. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I was uh, kind of feeding myself with what other were saying in our circle. And uh, there was a lot of thread, but I have few kind of points that will, that stuck with me. And uh, so first of all, it was personal attitude, reflex of blaming and shaming. Blaming and shaming that, uh, that blocks the change. Um, there were cultural patterns, that was actually my idea, cultural patterns um, uh, that serves some purposes. Uh, the blaming and shaming as a cultural pattern that serves maybe hierarchy, I don't know, question mark. Uh, toxic system, we fight against and we have, we want to blame and shame. Um, or maybe I didn't understand really what Dean wanted to say. I'm still thinking about it. And love in action, meditation and empathy as antidotum uh, for blaming and shaming. And when mm -hmm. I come to it, I'm thinking about time and some of you know that I have obsession of time as a factor of many problems we are facing. Lack of time actually and that probably again stacks with me the most time as a factor, lack of time as a factor of blaming and shaming and when we mm -hmm. have time for empathy, for love, we don't have to blame and shame. We can find the solution, the change, create the change. That's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, Graniani in rural Ontario. Hi, I changed my name because there was two ands and we keep being in the same groups. So um, uh, a couple of thoughts. One, uh, totally re agree that there's no place for blaming at all. It's a useless activity. Uh, shaming, I am a little bit more on the fence because shaming isn't good, but calling to account and demanding ethical responsibility from people if you're working together with them um, or expecting and uh, having that as, an ex as a set expectation is crucial. Um, I recommended a book that has been very influential for me uh, by uh, Anne Bishop from Nova Scotia, 
called Becoming an Ally, it deals with intersectionality and helps provide context. And then when I get totally desperate, uh, what I do is I say, um, hard as it is to deal with, as I say to myself, hard as it is to deal with you, it would be way harder being you in this world. You know, if people are carrying all that stuff around with them. So these are the main things that I came out of, you know, my reflection out of, out of our session. Thank you, Annie. Um, Kasha? Don't know how to say it. Can you hear us, Kasha? Let's move it around again. Um, okay, it's gone. Um, April, April grief song. Hmm. Yeah, listening to everyone. I'm. I love. I. I mean, yeah. That this particular dialogue showed me how the tensions that are created by this principle actually allow some of that um, invitation or you know create the space for some of this deep dialogue that we get into that takes us to our vulnerable places that is how we climb out of the shame behaviors from where i'm sitting in extinction rebellion and it's wonderful to hear your stories of being one but i can tell you from where i'm sitting it is not one <laughs> you know there are there is so much separation and there is a lot of blaming and shaming building up in the cracks between the separation and if if vulnerability is one of the places, if sharing vulnerability and, and therefore uh, in the practice of empathy in spaces like this, if that is one of the ways to climb out of it, then telling the truth about where we are now, about what is heading towards us and not getting distracted by the language that says we are somehow going to win or fix it is really really important because that is going to rip people open into the vulnerability and having the practice of empathy there to hold them and to uh you know to to be there to model it to show what it feels like when we stand rooted in the heartbreaking truth of what it is that's racing towards us, then this conversation is just so valuable. Thank you so much, everybody. Mm. Thank you, April. Um, and Jordan? Um, yeah, it was always, it's just a privilege to be in a, in a little group of people like this and to, to go around and hear people and the the kindness and generosity and the skills that we we have it's it's impressive and it's lovely to practice them and develop them so thank you for the opportunity and thank you all um okay thank you Anne. and um katie fessel Uh, hi. Yeah, I want to say thank you to my group. It was a really interesting group. Um, my brain's a little bit fried because I did a people's assembly before I came here. So I've been online a long time. But um, yeah, talking about blaming and shaming, I think what came up for me is the vulnerability that people show in the group. Um, I just I just have a real gratitude for because I think it, it helps us all to become more vulnerable. Um, yeah. And I really appreciate it. And particularly for me, different for everybody I know, but for me, I have some, in my family, I, I have males that don't share their vulnerabilities, older males. So being in these groups and hearing men talk like they do, I just find it fascinating. And I've got a lot of gratitude. So thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, 
Thank you so much, Katie. Is there someone I've missed? Because I might have on my going through. You missed yourself. Yeah, no, I know. I was just check if there's anyone else. <laughs> well, if not, I'll go. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm um, moved, I suppose, by the show what we're doing here and what we bring by doing this in our groups. Um, it might not solve all our problems and surely help. Uh, and I'm, I apologize for us going a bit above the hour. Um, and at the same time, I don't apologize for wanting to hear all of you. <laughs> so um, there'll be another one next week. Uh, with uh, principle nine, which someone can say what it is. We are a non-violent network. Oh, that one, brilliant. So uh, join us and if uh, you bring a friend, then we'll be more and we'll have to figure out how to work around with facilitators, but we'll figure it out. So bring a friend and let's uh, help grow this movement. It was lovely seeing all of you and see you hopefully again soon and i'll request if the facilitators please if you can stay be brief that'd be lovely thank you martha thank you bye thank, thank you. you bye everybody bye thank you bye thank you edwin thank you both. everyone bye bye thank you oh thank you martha thanks Mo. hi everyone thanks for facilitating james yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Do you want to stay don't you want to stay behind, James? Sure. For a debrief for you. Yeah, yeah. sure. And maybe if we just have a, a quick uh, bio break, that's possible. Just a minute. Sure. Better stop the recording.